Last episode, we began listening to the story of my dad's life and involvement in Bible translation. In this second and final part, we'll hear about how he broke his neck while in the village, spiritual warfare he and my mom faced, the translation work, and more. So let's get started. Enjoy. When we were just finishing building the house, we had just got the roof put on. We had been there on and off over two or three years, visiting and staying in somebody else's place. What happened was that the two things happened. The main beam for the structure was too thin to hold the weight of tiles. And then the person who made the tiles did not fire them long enough and so they were basically sponges. And that was, uh, we didn't realize that. And we finished putting the roof on just before the rain started. And then the rains came down like big time. And we could hear that main beam creaking with the weight of the water, the waterlogged tiles. And uh, it looked like it was going to give. So I asked a carpenter to get me a pole to put up underneath that beam so that... Uh, it wouldn't come down, but the the beam had sway it had a sway back to it, so our our house started to look like a pagoda, and so tiles don't work very well when they're that deeply uh, sway backed. So water was starting to come in. the The tiles were backwashing instead of washing off. We got that pole, and he was helping me put the pole up. And I had a hydraulic jack that uh, I was going to use to, once the pole was in place, to, to lift it a little bit so it wouldn't be this sway back uh, beam. And well, what I didn't know is that the guy had brought me a pole that had a knot in it, almost as wide of a knot as the, the whole pole. So it was like having an elbow in the middle of a pole. And so as I started pumping up the, the jack, the pressure was too much on the pole. So I had raised maybe three or four inches, and the thing just flew apart completely. Well, that meant that the beam had to come back down, but it, it didn't stop where it, had been, where it had been. And so it just kept coming. And uh, so the whole 700 tiles that were over that room all came down with all the, the other pieces of wood they were holding the whole thing up. And one of the cross beams landed on my foot as I was trying to move away from the center of the room because I knew the whole beam was going to come down there. So I didn't want to get crushed by the beam. But I really didn't know what was going to happen. But as I moved away, this other structure came down and caught my foot so I couldn't move anymore. And it was a, that's the way the Lord saved my life because if I'd gone back just another inch, the stuff that was going to be dragged off the wall by this all this wood that was sitting on top of the walls, they started pulling big, huge chunks of uh, adobe bricks down. And one of them just grazed the back of my neck, and it, and it broke off one of the, the apophyses of, the, of a cervical spine. And the, other, the fellow that was with me, the carpenter, he went to the other side of the room, and he had a, a cross beam come down across his head and opened up a whole part of his, his scalp. It wasn't too deep, but it, it was a glancing blow, but it opened him up pretty bad. Of course, I didn't know that at the moment. I was kind of buried under a bunch of tiles, just my head was basically poking through the through the mess. Just minutes before, you you had been laying in the bed where this room was, and I had said to your mom, well, you really should take Andrew out because... Uh, you were asleep, but uh, move him out because this is, looks kind of dangerous. And uh, well, we're sure glad we did because they, I don't think you would have survived being crushed by something that heavy. And you were just, uh, what, nine months old or something like that? So, and uh, I knew I was in shock because I, I felt really weird. And although I didn't have any abrasions in my neck, but something I knew something was wrong, and my foot is the one that really hurt. 
but nothing actually. I had nothing broke on my foot, but it still was painful. So I decided I better get this fella's uh, scalp taken care of while I still was in shock. <laughs> so I didn't feel any pain. But I, his, uh, it was so complicated the way his wound was that I ended up just using his own hair that was soaked in blood and tied knots across from one side of the wound to the other and used that instead of uh, stitches. And the blood actually dried and held it together. And they were able to call the MAF plane to come and get us. And by then it was late afternoon and it was rain, starting to, it was getting ready to rain. And it was kind of questionable whether the plane could even make it. And uh, But he did, and uh, I was able to ride a horse up to the airstrip, and we took the carpenter with us. That was quite an event, uh, basically. And that was all before what happened that I was telling about being at the big assembly with with uh, the folks out there. So how long did it take you to heal? Six months after surgery. So they had to take the piece out that was broken and reattach ligaments and muscles. And so it was very painful. You have so many muscles that are attached there <laughs> and ligaments. Uh, and I had that physical therapy for a couple of months, and little by little I got my strength back, so especially in my arms. My arms became very, very weak because of the effect of the nerves on the neck. So... Back to your first language helper, Francisco. How did you find him? Well, we we became friends uh, uh, near the beginning of our time out there because we were able to take uh, parasite treatment because his wife was in very, very bad shape. And so we t- took care of her health. And then they had two sons, and they both were malnourished just because of having problems with diarrhea and parasites. So they were more open than some people to treating their kids and, and his, the wife. So they, they got into really good shape health-wise. And that built a friendship. And then when we started looking for somebody to take with us out to the translation center and do some more serious work, that's who we, we chose. And that, that lasted a, a good while. I think we were able to do a, a whole draft of the Book of Mark uh, you know, very primitive, but it was something. But then uh, he came down with uh, epilepsy. We tried to work with him for a, still for a couple of years, and uh, it, he became so incapacitated with the epilepsy that we finally had to say, okay, well, we'll have to find somebody else to help us. And it started affecting his eyesight. It was a strange kind of epilepsy, not what you would normally know about. It affected the eyes more than anything else. So after him, who did you start working with? Well, there was a, a kind of a hiatus. <laughs> we looked and looked for people and asked for people, and it was very difficult because now we weren't at a translation center. We were in a home in the city, and the uh, there was a group of believers that had just gotten baptized, and we needed to disciple them, do a lot of teaching. So... We didn't do much translation for a while. We were just getting getting a church started. And we also started a church in the city. After a, a couple of years in the city, then our oldest child, Sharon, came down with diabetes. And that really kind of threw a monkey wrench into a lot of things. We didn't have refrigeration for insulin in the village. And so we had to figure out how to do that, to make short trips with ice. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, another missionary who was retiring had a kerosene refrigerator. And so we were able to go to another state and pick up that refrigerator and then transport it out to the village. By then there was a dirt road that it took about 15 hours to, to make it from the city to, to the village. So uh, some Wycliffe folks uh, that we had known since the year one, they had a, a young lady that was working for them as a maid. And uh, one day the, the missionary wife asked where she was from and what language she spoke. So she realized that she was a speaker from our tribal area. And in fact, from our actual, the village that we were living in when we would go out there. 
and uh, her name is Filomena. She let us know, so I, w- I went to the house of this other family to meet this girl. She was a young lady. She was like in her 20s at that time. The interesting thing was that she was a total native speaker, and she had been speaking pretty much her own language until she was 19. And then she left the village because her dad wanted her to marry a drunk. And she, so she escaped from the village, basically, and found a, a, the MAF pilot's wife found a job for her with a Christian family. So she started hearing the gospel, and of course, in Spanish, and started working for different families. And it was uh, kind of her introduction to Christianity, and eventually she became a Christian. So by the time... We met, she's, she had already made her decision for Christ. Uh, she didn't know much, but she she had made that decision. And of course, it was already costing her persecution by her family. Anyway, so we asked her to, to come to our place and work for a couple hours a week because she had a full-time and made jobs for every day of the week except for Sunday where she'd go to church and wash her clothes or whatever. And she lived with a family that were non-Christians. And that was real interesting because she she really knew her stuff as far as her language, but she wasn't very bilingual. But I figured I could work with that. And then as people started uh, no longer needing her services because they left or they moved or whatever, we started paying her to come to our place for those days. And eventually we had her every day, basically. And so that was a, a real blessing because we were able to go back over the Book of Mark that had been done. And in fact, Francisco was her uncle. So that was interesting combination there. She understood what he was thinking, but she also understood a little bit more of Spanish because she had lived in the city for about 10 years by the time we got to start working with her. And at the same time, I was teaching her how to use a computer, how to write her own language, because we pretty much decided how to write it by the time we started working with her. We only made one major change uh, since we started working with her, which was how to illustrate uh, nasal quality to the vowels. And so that was a, a bit of a challenge, because we... We followed some schemes that other people have used, but it wasn't working very well because there's nasalized vowels and then there's pre-nasalized consonants. And that can get kind of tricky if you use a N after a vowel to illustrate nasalization of that vowel. It's going to run into a word that starts with an N as a nasalization of a consonant. It just, it looked horrible. <laughs> So we started using the two dots over the vowel for nasalization. So we have five vowels that are sound like Spanish vowels, and they're voiced. And then we have five that are nasalized, and then we have five that are voiceless, at the, usually at the beginning of a word. As far as I remember, you did you did Luke, you've done a Jesus film, right. you've done Firm Foundations. Firm Foundations book from New Tribes. Yeah, that was uh, really important to do the Jesus film. But, of course, we had to translate Luke. And then we had to find voices. So then we made cassettes of what they were supposed to listen to to learn their lines because they didn't know how to read their own language. And even though we gave them a a script in their language, for it's about 20 individuals that did all this. And then we started bringing them one by one to the translation center in Mitla to record. There's a separate ministry that does Bible recordings. It was amazing to see people watch that in their own language. Uh, I was I was really impressed with how effective it was. And most people had to watch the movie like three times before they actually start listening to the message. They were, first of all, they were fascinated by the way people dressed and the different kinds of animals that that are in the movie. They were hearing their language. It was just so astounding because there was no movies ever in their language. And most people had never seen a movie. That was the, the blessing of it. The good old days when movies were actually special in some places in the world. Some places. So then... Uh, 
So that by the third time, they actually start listening to the message because the, the impact of the visual and the audio was just really overwhelming. We, we, would, we would watch people and they were actually frozen. They wouldn't even move for two hours. <laughs> and uh, we were wondering how they would feel the next day, you know. And the first time we showed it in El Carrizal, we showed it on a basketball court. It was absolutely hilarious to see people had climbed trees in the distance to be able to watch the movie. They didn't want anybody to see them actually showing up and watching a, a Protestant movie. So they they would figure out a way to watch it without being seen. <laughs> a little bit of Nicodemus. <laughs> but, uh, of course, we had to act like we didn't see anything, you know. But, uh, yeah, people were just impacted by that. And then we followed that up with uh, Firm Foundations, New Tribes. That took about two years to do. It's a really good summary of the of the Old Testament, especially, and then, of course, part of the New Testament. For, for those who aren't familiar, Firm Foundations is helping people walk through the Bible from creation to Christ with short summary chapters of kind of yeah, giving the, people the highlights a basically the highlights that that illustrate the tr- road to the cross and the substitutionary death of Christ so there's blood in the uh, sacrifices uh, like with Abel and, and Cain there's blood with Abraham and Isaac there's those kind of things so that it would lead up to that so yeah you, you you translated all of that which is huge it's um I don't know. Do you know how many thousands of words that has in it? I mean, it's huge. I would estimate maybe two hundred thousand words at least. Uh, probably maybe more, because yeah. we we took our time. We since it wasn't all scripture, we took our time and, and uh, kind of fleshing out the stories. So we didn't try to make it abbreviated like you have to do with scripture. You know, kind of stick to the to the script. <laughs> then you, you recorded that in audio? Yes. It's in so, audio and it's printed. And yeah. you have the audio of the Jesus film, was that right, that you put on Mega Voices? And, right. Uh-huh. And passed around. So for those who aren't aware of Mega Voice, it's, a, it's been around for how many years now? Well, like quite a bit, 20 years at 20 least. 20 years or something. They specialize in making devices that can play audio bibles and biblical resources and, and solar often, powered often that are solar powered so right. you've done a lot with mega voice right um you also at some point you were going around to neighboring villages spreading pamphlets or prints of of some translated scripture uh-huh but, but kind of as a side to the Jesus film and to Mega Voices and later on uh, Memory Sticks that work as a, as a uh, MP3 player with earphones. One of the experiences that I, I enjoy telling is a, a three-year-old had been listening to a Mega Voice Old Testament stories and one day his grandmother showed up and he says, Grandma, Grandma, come sit down. I want to tell you a story. And so she said, what, is, what in the world? What do you want to tell me a story about? How do you know stories? You know, it's just three years old. And so she sat down, and he started quoting the story from that he had heard on the uh, Firm Foundations. It was quite amazing. She just was floored that this three-year-old knew this story. And one story after, oh, I'll tell you another one, Grandma. <laughs> I heard about it later on. I heard stories of, of people finding a mega voice that somebody had dropped or whatever and and listening to it. Others had found cassettes of the different things that we had and uh, came to know the Lord for finding this cassette in the, basically in the trash. <laughs> if I remember right, there was response from some of the Catholic Church to you handing out Scripture. Yeah, especially in this one village that we went to, which was a long ways away, and quite a few wanted 
the, the scriptures that we were handing out, especially the younger, younger people could actually read it because they knew how to read Spanish. And we had really worked hard on making it not look so weird that they could actually read it after a little bit of help. And yeah, then all of a sudden, the next assembly day, the authorities say, everybody bring your stuff, we're going to burn it here, that the missionary you know, left off. And uh, so the next time we went, it was, it was a lot of fun because some of the folks uh, told us what had happened. I says, but I didn't take mine to be burned. <laughs> mm-hmm. So they were not successful with erasing everything. So some some little group started meeting, actually, as a result of that. Back to translation. Uh, you've had a lot of hang-ups over the years and challenges and distractions. So could you speak to what you've learned through those obstacles and how you've persevered through some of those challenges? Okay, well, there there's a principle that uh, I had to come to terms with, and that God's Word will not return void. As much as I wanted to say, hey, you know, I finished this or whatever, (laughs) I had to believe, and I think it was correct, but it it took effort to believe that whatever we had done already was still going to be useful. And as it went out little piece by piece or whatever, uh, recordings or what were printed, uh, but mostly recorded. I had to believe that that was going to have the the majority impact because a culture that's not used to reading has never seen their language. That had to be then the way. And in Romans ten tells us that you know how can you believe if you haven't heard? It doesn't say if you haven't haven't read. So I I hung on to that because. Yes, we did have challenges. We had interruptions and, and things that happened. And from a human point of view, you say, well, this is a disaster. You know, this is, we're not getting anywhere. I mean, I still remember saying, you know, just before we went to the field, well, now we have computers, dear people. And so we can do the translation in half the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. We remembered having said that. And I'd say, well, um, that wasn't quite what happened. And actually, using a computer, you can be a whole lot more picky and be a lot more accurate and a lot more. But it takes time. And, it, and of course, it depends on who you have to help you is how creative getting the concepts across the language barrier. But early on, we, we felt, well, let's just put it this way. I would walk through the storage areas at the translation center and see boxes and boxes and boxes of New Testaments sitting there, getting moldy or getting dusty or whatever. And uh, I I did not want to be part of that. And I I knew in my gut that if the people didn't hear it, it would be pretty useless to hand them a book at this stage of the game. And so so we really concentrated on recording everything we could get our hands on. We even came up with little choruses that we translated from Spanish. And, of course, that was a new concept because nobody had any songs in Chitino. There were no songs. There was no music. They had a funeral dirge with a drum and a flute. That was all there was left in the culture. And uh, I don't know what happened to the music, but to me it was very sad because both your mom and I are very musical, and so it was really difficult to see that. But but as soon as we introduced those choruses and so on, oh my, the kids just loved it, and they could sing their hearts out and, one little guy would go take care of his goats on the mountainside, and he'd be singing all day, all these choruses. He, was, he had a good voice, too. As an adult, he can still do that. So that was our, our, our uh, hope and our belief that the recorded word was going to have much more impact, especially for this generation. But since the next generation got to go to school, got to learn how to read and write in Spanish at a high level as compared to what they had before, Filomena's generation. Well, that made it just all the difference in the world. And so so you could contemplate handing a book to somebody. But my dream is is to have a recorder uh, next to a book and so that people can listen and look at the words and and use that combination. 
for this generation and the and the one coming up because uh, that's that really would cement the truth and eliminate those barriers of being able to to even comprehend the, the printed page because the culture is so oral it is just it it would be foolishness to just depend on a book and, uh, I just don't I don't particularly want to be foolish. <laughs> so it's now been 40 years mm-hmm. or so. You're still working with Philomena on right. the New Testament. Right. You've published portions, but you haven't published the whole thing yet. Right. You're in the midst of polishing things. You're also she's her life has changed, right? Yep. She so got married, and now she has she a, got married, a child. She has a kid, and that has slowed down a lot of things. Right. And so now you're working with a, a young guy who is interested in helping. Right. Very bright, and there's another generation, and just got in a serious accident that almost killed him. Right. Yeah. So now he has a lot of time to work on the translation because he he can't do anything else, basically. And uh, my, I've been incrementally getting them used to the idea of video conferencing and working together on the things that I have pointed out in the text that need to be looked at. And uh, they are individually doing the same thing. And then when they get together, then they can discuss uh, the things that have been flagged. I, I every time we get together I see another notch higher in the terms of being able to work together, being able to understand the issues. So like today we were working on Jesus saying talking about the manna in the wilderness and that he's the bread of life and the, and then you're supposed to eat him <laughs> and the Jews say, What is he talking about? You know, why is he saying that we have to eat him, his flesh, and and it's very problematic, uh, but it's it's classic and uh, between a spiritual understanding and just a physical understanding. But we want to pr- preserve that tension that's happening in the text, and before we weren't quite getting it. So it's really a, really a great great experience working at this stage. So the the village, you've seen it change drastically over the years. You've seen it go from a place where they had almost nothing, no road to get there, only an airstrip, no electricity, of course, no brick houses of any kind. No running water. And no Coca-Cola. And no bathrooms. And then you've seen the mass migration to the U.S. of illegal workers from the village and money start pouring in from the states and the whole place getting transformed. Yeah, drugs arrived. Jealousy and crime and all that influx with along with the dollars coming in. And um, now they have internet. Now, now they have cell phones. Cell phones. Know how to use. Young people have computers. The, the road only takes six hours to get there from the city as opposed to 15 hours. Maybe you could t- talk a little bit about what it's like seeing that change, that big of a change over the years, and how, how it's affecting people spiritually and how it's affecting the language vitality. Well, the, the influx of people who have now finished a high school in Spanish, though that generation is now sticking some words from Spanish in their conversation in Chitino, even though the majority of is Chitino, but they're used to certain words because of their education. Our desire is that to conserve the language expression as much as possible. There's villages so far away that there's hardly anybody that speaks Spanish in those villages, especially the adult population. So that's one side of it. But the other side is people who have left the village to go to California or other places, but mostly California, and work in the agricultural fields. The phenomena that really 
breaks our heart is that families are being broken up. Men will leave and never come back. Usually get themselves another family. Uh, and in one case, the guy came back, came back to the village with another wife and told the one that was in his house to leave. So he wasn't even content to have two wives. He just wanted that one now. Well, that's just like basically condemning somebody to death almost to, to be shoved out of their home. For a woman, there's just no recourse, really, except maybe prostitution. But mostly they just have to go home to their parents. But a lot of them, their parents aren't living anymore. That's one thing. And then the other thing is I was talking to a man uh, a few years ago that was a grandfather age for that culture. And the typical question that I'd always ask men for years is, uh, well, how, how much corn do you plant this year? And they, you know, they have this little measuring box made out of wood. And, and uh, he said, oh, I, I don't have to plant anymore. My son's in California and he sends me money, so I just buy corn. So there's great swaths of arable land that are not being planted. And that spells disaster for a community. Uh, when the times get tough, nobody's going to plant because they're used to $10 an hour instead of $1, $1 an hour. That's the difference. It's a tenfold difference between the countries. And uh, some may even get more. It's a sad outlook for families. And that's why it's even more important, the gospel, to save the families that are left. I guess I'm wondering if there's anything that you would like to speak on that we haven't touched on so far that you think is important, part of your story, and maybe for other people to hear who are in Bible translation or thinking of doing Bible translation. Well, one of the things that we really feel strong about and and we felt totally unprepared for it was the spiritual warfare that's involved in Bible translation. Because the enemy knows that if people hear the truth, the truth will set them free. All our time out in the village area, we would hear people talk about what they believe. It is just astounding the size of lies that people had come to believe. Uh, it was just, it was mind boggling. And one of the, because of our medical background, you know, we, we would uh, see a lady have a baby. And so we would take up some food, you know, her some food. And, oh, no, you can't have any protein for 40 days after you have a baby. And, you know, we were dumbfounded. I said, well, why is that? Well, that's the what we believe. It didn't have anything to do with religion. It just a lie from the from hell. <laughs> and no wonder so many ladies died, you know, from childbirth or right after childbirth because they basically starved. Other situations, like a lady came to us and said, uh, do you have any medicine for me? Well, they don't call it medicine. They call it a remedy. They said, do you have a remedy for me? And I said, well, what do you have? And and uh, she said, well, I, I eat dirt. And I'd never heard that before. And I was, I really didn't know what to say. It was, and I said, well, why do you, why do you eat dirt? <laughs> and uh, she didn't know. She just said, I'm very hungry, you know, and so I eat dirt. And it turned out that she would use her fingernails and go along the adobe walls and scrape off enough adobe and then ate, then ate it. I can't imagine what that did to her system. And it was mostly pregnant women that would do that. So we were able to help people with that. But you can imagine the learning curve for somebody that has believed that and how many generations have believed that. You know? This was because of, of what? what the malnutrition. malnutrition. Yeah, they needed minerals, but not from dirt, <laughs> clay. So stuff like that. So we started taking maternity vitamins systems out, you know, to help with that. And, uh, you would not believe the babies we started seeing. You know, they were like a different tribe <laughs> almost because they they were twice the size of the other babies that had already been born and much more healthy. Uh, the moms were not in uh, in a crisis for having lost a whole bunch of calcium and all that with the, the during the pregnancy. I'm not sure why I got off on that, but 
Anyway. You were talking about spiritual warfare. It's just these these lies. That's one, one part of the equation. But the other part was that the uh, spiritual activity that was haunting and influencing the people, especially at night, was horrendous. It was just unbelievable what was going on. And we were pretty much ignorant of it. I still remember asking our host when we first got there, I said, well, are there any witch doctors in this village? <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> well, I found out later there was one on every corner. <laughs> but anyway, but he was afraid that if he told me the truth, I would leave because he was scared of the witch doctors, even though he was a baby Christian, but he, he just, he knew they were powerful. Right? He knew they could kill, they could maim, they could do all kinds of things to you, bring you bad luck. So we had lots of manifestations of spiritual activity uh, against us and against other people, especially at the beginning when we really didn't know what was going on. And, uh, well, for instance, the people that lived near us, our place out there, when we were there, they would not sleep at night. They were afraid that we would do something to them at night so they wouldn't go to sleep. And, uh, Is this joke, because of the lies from from the priest about white people, or was this their own It was fears? a combination, of just because we were an unknown quantity, and they, they really didn't know what white people did at night. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we everything we did was weird. <laughs> so I can understand that. I joke about that the real estate value around us went way, way down. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? And all I could do is write our supporters and say, look, I don't care whether you send me money or not. I I need you to be praying for us because it's a very dark place. And a book was written about that by Kitty Pride about all the different missionaries who had attempted to reach the Chitino area and just disaster after disaster after disaster. Yeah especially the very first guy that went, he died 24 hours after visiting the village. Nobody knew what, what happened. But getting back to the, the warfare, and then my neighbor in the village was experiencing some of the things that we were, but he never, ever even mentioned or even hinted at what was going on at night in his little port courtyard. And we were having all kinds of stuff happen. We'd have a herd of horses come roaring by our house during the night, and the the ground would shake, and uh, it would wake me up, startled, at three in the morning. It just uh, scared the boo out of me because you know, it was the last thing you expect at that time of night. And I was wondering, who in the world is herding a bunch of animals stampeding past our house? You know, at that time of night, I go out in the morning looking for hoof prints. And there weren't any. And so when I told my neighbor what I had learned and what was going on at our house, he said, oh, man, that's nothing. You ought to be at my place. <laughs> and for the first time, he was able to share the tr- what they were suffering every night at their place. Uh, huge amounts of noise and racket. and somebody, It sounded like somebody dragging a tin roof around their courtyard. And we found out later that that uh, his wife's grandmother had cursed all of her descendants. And so they would wake up in the morning with teeth marks and bruises on their skin, their legs, their torso, or their arms. And that's called the witch bite by them. And there's demons harassing these poor people. And so we taught them how to pray, take their authority in Christ. And that was the end of it. And then we were able to find out the spiritual history of that place. And so two or three generations back, this guy had made a pact with the devil and sacrificed a black calf to Satan, just not too far from where we lived. So he would basically turned over the whole area to Satan because he wanted to be rich. And so the witch doctor said, well, if you do this sacrifice, Satan will make you rich. And he did. He became rich, which out there was to have lots of cattle. And uh, But the end of his life was pretty sad because 
he was being harassed by a herd of black calves running around his house, which is what I was hearing at my place. And that, that herd was was going all around the whole village. So once we prayed at our place, that was the end of that. Then my neighbor, same thing. That was the end of the harassment in his place. And we had to do that with all the believers and tried to train them how to deal with this, that they really had authority in Christ. We're some of the oldest people on the field in translation in this area because most have either finished what they wanted their goal, whether it was the Lord's goal or not, but they got their goal done and and they're back in their home country. I I feel that what I'm seeing now, I'm I'm see I'm getting to see third generation Christians from our ministry. And wow, you know, just that's huge, you know. And that's not an experience that a short term missionary is ever gonna have. You know. There is so much to be done, especially in training local leaders so that they can carry on the work after we leave or after we die. It's most probable would we'll die here. <laughs> you know? But uh, in the meantime, we, there's just lots and lots of stuff to do. And we continue helping people with their health, uh, which is a, a real blessing also. So we know that we've been able to help people survive their mission experience because of getting some proper medical help. It's just an extension of what the Lord called us to do. And it's very, very uh, rewarding that way. So yes, may this be a blessing to all of those that, escu- that escuchan, <laughs> get listened to this. And the, the way the Lord measures success is very different than the way we measure success. Thanks for listening, and another huge thank you to my dad. I hope this interview was interesting, encouraging, and edifying. And next up is the story of my other grandfather, my mom's dad. You're definitely not going to want to miss it. It's probably the most classic pioneer-style missionary story in my family, so make sure you're subscribed. Subscribe.